IO9 presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here are your hosts, John Joseph Adams and David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 43 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Hi, this is John Joseph Adams. I'm the editor of Lightspeed and Fantasy Magazine, and I'm also the editor of several anthologies. I have several coming out next year, including Under the Moons of Mars, which features stories inspired by the Barsoom saga by Edgar Rice Burroughs, Armored, which is about powered armored soldiers and mecha, and The Mad Scientist's Guide to World Domination, which is about mad scientists and evil geniuses trying to take over the world. The next book I have coming out, which comes out in November, is Lightspeed Year One, which collects all of the fiction published in the first year of Lightspeed Magazine. And I'm David Barr Kirtley. I'm the author of many short stories, including The Disciple, about a student who studies black magic at a New England university. The story originally appeared in Weird Tales magazine, and will be appearing later this year in the anthology New Cthulhu, which collects some of the best Lovecraftian fiction of the past decade, including stories by Neil Gaiman, Sherry Priest, and China Mieville. And speaking of China Mieville, he's our guest today. He's an award-winning English fantasy fiction writer who describes his work as weird fiction after early 20th century pulp and horror writers such as H.P. Lovecraft, and who belongs to a loose group of writers sometimes called New Weird. He's also active in left-wing politics as a member of the Socialist Workers' Party. He stood for the House of Commons for the Socialist Alliance and published his PhD thesis as a book on Marxism and international law. He teaches creative writing at Warwick University. All right, well, let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with China Mieville. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Okay, so first of all, uh, could you just tell us about your new novel, Embassy Town? What's it about? Uh, it's, um, it's about uh, a group of humans who live on a very distant alien planet in the very far future um, and uh, get involved in uh, a linguistic apocalypse with the local species. And it's about um, language and... Um, uh, subspace and lots of uh, kind of classic science fiction or stuff like that. Um, hopefully, also bringing a bit of of, of 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 interesting linguistic ruminations to the table. Um, okay, so yeah, I mean, this is your first real quote unquote science fiction novel. You know, some writers maintain that science fiction is more rigorous and realistic than fantasy, while others feel that science fiction is simply one flavor of fantasy. Uh, where do you come down on that? Uh, I basically on the latter. I don't. I don't buy the argument about the kind of scientific rigor of science fiction. I mean, some, let, let me be clear, some science fiction is, is, is predicated on, um, on, on, on relatively rigorous kind of extrapolation from scientific fact, but an awful lot of it isn't. And the moment one starts trying to police that border, you get into um, an incredible amount of special pleading and bad faith and exceptionality and, yeah, but you know what I mean and all that kind of thing. Um, so... I think it's much more to do with um, a certain kind of, uh, of, of of attitude of kind of scientific expertise. There's a certain show of rigor, but the show is uh, in many cases completely spurious. And we can think of many examples of classic works of science fiction um, in which the supposedly kind of rigorous extrapolation is completely bogus. I mean, and I should add that this is not in any way a criticism. Uh, that, that's, that there's nothing wrong with any of this. It makes for some wonderful books. But I do think the idea that, you know, science fiction is based on a kind of, uh, you know, rigorous cognitive extrapolation and fantasy is just sort of silly dreaming is, is, um, is completely untrue. And, and, and this is an argument that goes back to, H.G. Wells versus Jules Verne, and I take Wells's part in that debate. Okay, and do you think that anything like the Ariecki, the Ambassadors, or the Immer is actually possible, or are they, are they just interesting storytelling devices? I strongly suspect the vast majority of it is impossible. I don't really know. I'm, I mean, it's, 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 I don't think them up because I think they're possible. Um, I suspect that the, the, the nature of the language that the Ariecki speak for example, which is essentially free of symbolism, um, I strongly suspect is impossible. Um, obviously, you don't know. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not very easily falsifiable, um, but I suspect it's impossible. I suspect very much that there is not a particular kind of subspace that we might call the Immer that works differently from our physical universe and has pre-existed our physical universe and so on. Um, I mean, one of the pleasures of science fiction is being able to think this stuff up and not getting bogged down with the question of whether or not it's it's real. 
Uh, so, so you said that this book is a tribute to a particular type of science fiction from the 60s and 70s. Uh, what do you admire about those books, and do you think there's something missing from today's science fiction? No, I'm not. I'm not intending to kind of, you know, sit here and diss what's going on now. It, it's more a question of, uh, as I was growing up as a reader, there was a certain, you know, that because of the time I, I was growing up, I, I think I uh, ended up reading a lot of science fiction that was post golden age, if you like, post fifties, but so still infused with some of that kind of um, kind of awe and excitement, but with a certain kind of. Um, uh, in, in many cases, a kind of critical attitude to certain of certain of the the elements of some of that earlier tradition, um, and uh, you know also simply some absolutely beautiful writing. So, people like Le Guin and um, and Silverberg, you know, loom very large for me. And 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 a little bit later in life, you know, kind of finding the work of people like Cordwainer Smith, um, you know, the, 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 these kind of not classic space operas by any means or classic sort of planetary romances, but a certain kind of slightly melancholy, but nonetheless quite sweeping kind of sociologically interesting, uh, critical, um, problematic, toothy um, SF was incredibly formative for me. And I wanted to write something that nodded and kind of very much kind of uh, paid tribute to that tradition, I think. What were some of the other big influences on this book, uh, particularly in terms of linguistics or philosophy? You know, for me, at least, the book is not so much about sp kind of actually existing linguistics necessarily, uh, um, so much as it is to do with a certain kind of more abstract kind of philosophy of language and philosophy of, 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 of sim symbols and semiotics. Um, and indeed, some of this kind of crosses over into theological debates. There's a long-running theological argument, you know, from the kind of 17th century on about what's sometimes called the Adamic language, the, the, the language of the Garden of Eden, where, uh, although one, one might, one, one should probably just as equally call it the, 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 Eve, <laughs> the Eve language. Um, uh, but it, it, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the notion whereby, you know, there is no gap of, sim of symbolism between the word and the thing. Um, uh, I mean, I do have a kind of minor background in sociolinguistics, so that sort of did come into it to some extent. But for me, it was more kind of language philosophy. People like I.A. Richards and um, Tran Duc Tao, who's a, a very interesting philosopher of language, and uh, Paul Ricoeur, some of his kind of hermeneutics of metaphor and, and things like that. Um, I mean, I have a kind of Gannett approach to a lot of linguistic philosophy where I, I mean I, I don't by any means claim to be an expert but I sort of kind of swoop around and grab what looks interesting um and I and I I, I guess this was stuff I'd been I've been interested in some of that philosophy for a long time so it sort of embedded itself um uh, in in what I was reading and, and and kind of percolated up until until it was ready to go uh, I heard you say in an interview that maybe Gulliver's Travels was also an influence yeah, very much so. I mean, Gulliver's Travels is a huge book for me. Um, and that, you know, one of the kind of taproot texts of the kind of, of the kind of Here Be Monsters, Strange Travel uh, uh, book, but also in, in the case of Gulliver's Travels, that's particularly so because there are also these questions of, of again, I wouldn't necessarily say language in, an, in, 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 in a concrete sense, but of kind of s symbology, you know, there's, you know, the, the, the the Huinahim, obviously, the, the kind of incredibly noble horses who are unable to lie um, and find the whole idea of lying extremely strange. But uh, there's also, in the, uh, in the neglected third book, there's a, a group of people who are, are trying to dispense with the necessity of words by carrying around everything they might need to refer to so they can just, like, they can just kind of hold it, you know, put it forward um, rather than saying the word. And obviously in Gulliver's Travels, that's played for his usual kind of acidic laughs. Um, uh, and in my case, I wanted to kind of take those two elements of the book, which, as I say, is an immensely important book for me, and try and kind of combine them and do what I think SF and fantasy does well, it can do well anyway, I don't, I mean, I hope it works, is, is to take something which is prima facie absurd and then have a very straight face about it and take it very seriously and respectfully and extrapolate it out as if it is not absurd, and hopefully to make it not absurd in the process. 
All right, so, I mean, you've said that you played a lot of Dungeons & Dragons as a kid. Uh, did those games... <laughs> this is following straight on from Not Absurd. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> carry on. Uh, did those I'm, ga- allowed to, I'm allowed to say that. I mean that affectionately. I, you know, I, I, I am indeed a, 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 a gamer or was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, did, did those games that you played, was, did they feature the standard elves and dwarves and stuff like that? Or was there anything in them that would be recognizable as a precursor to Boss Log or, or any of your other uh, writings? Uh, no, I didn't tend to, I didn't tend to, to DM, so I, I kind of took whatever was going. I think when I, part of the reason I write the kind of things that I write is because the actual specific stuff of characters wandering around doing stuff, although I really enjoyed it, um, was, was not the primary draw for me at a creative level. At a creative level, the primary draw for me is, 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 is it w- was the world creation stuff. So I played... Dungeons and Dragons. I played Bushido. I played um, a lot of Call of Cthulhu. Uh, like like a lot of people of my generation, I came to Lovecraft through the RPG rather than the other way around. Um, I played some Traveller. I played Villains and Vigilantes. I played a lot of these games and enjoyed them very much. But I think on the whole, they tended to be fairly um, fairly canonical versions of the games that, that were played. Um, because equally like a lot of gamers, when I was playing, you, you're kind of beholden to whatever is going on around you in terms of the game. So I played a lot of Merp middle earth role playing, even though I was never particularly (laughs) enamored of that setting. Um, but I still enjoyed the games. I mean, I certainly would have imagined that you would have been the, that you would have been the DM. I mean, why do you think that you weren't? Um, partly, I guess probably kind of laziness. I don't, I mean, you know, to DM well, I think is a, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and I think because as I say, I mean, you know, like, again, like a huge number of geeks, what I did do was, you know, I had endless like notebooks full of invented continents and invented races and invented this and invented that, that were originally, I was starting to codify with a notion that I was going to do this as a game. And the process of inventing them, simply became its own end. Um, and the, you know, the question of, it wasn't that I had a disinclination to let people play in them. It was just a question of why bother? I was getting the kick out of it by doing the, the creation. So, um, you know, to, and to go for the step from the basic creation to kind of actually, you know, writing or running a, 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 a scenario is a very different thing. And that step, that kind of concretization of the world creation for a scenario was something that didn't have a huge amount of appeal to me. Uh, so, you know, it's been seven years since your last Boss Log novel. Uh, looking back on those books, what do you think are their respective strengths and weaknesses, and is there anything you wish you could change? I'm, I mean, I think I'm fairly... I, I, I try not to be too defensive about about the books that I write. I try, like, you know, I mean, obviously, like any writer I get, you know, I've been very lucky a lot of people really like the books but there's also obviously you get you get criticism and i think there's a if we possibly can it's very good to try try and like kind of respond to criticism and kind of hear it out it doesn't necessarily mean you'll agree with it you may end up disagreeing with it but not to kind of you know um straight off the bat dismiss it but you know sometimes you can really learn from from criticism and you have to kind of hold up your hands and acknowledge the things you did you did wrong i wouldn't say that i wish i could do anything differently on the whole I mean, I'm sure I can think of a few exceptions, but on the whole, each book feels very much to me embedded in a moment and is almost a kind of historical record for me of that moment. So the idea of of changing it, it doesn't really, it doesn't, isn't really the, the, the point because even though there may be things I would do very differently now, I recognize that that was what it was at the time, you know. So for example, I'm very aware that Perdido Street Station is a, an ill-disciplined book um it is it is not a not a kind of tightly structured book and i think i was vaguely aware of that at the time but i've become much more self-critically aware of it uh later on but i don't wish i could change it because i think what the people that like that book like about it is not unrelated to that kind of rumbustious ill-discipline and sort of shagginess which you know if if you're lucky can have a a certain charm but it's not the kind of thing i would necessarily do now you know so i think you know i'm very aware that that book is um is 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 not terribly disciplined um there's certain i think in the scar this is this is very cruel to make me go through self-criticism but (laughs) but, I, i think with the scar there was um i was i was striving very hard to 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 do a certain 
thing with the prose, and I'm very proud of that book, but uh, you know, I certainly don't think I had always cracked what I was trying to do. Um, uh, you know, it, it feels like part of a process to me, of which Iron Council was the culmination. And Iron Council, I know, is the book of those three that a large number of readers are very dissatisfied with and, 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 and did not like nearly as much. And I can only say that it is not purely, I promise, in the spirit of contrarianism that I say, to me, it's by some way my favorite of those three books. Um, and I don't mean that just to be kind of pissy and ornery. I, I genuinely... To me, it's by no means a perfect book. I know that very well, but it 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 does what it, it does certain things. I think it's much more ambitious at a at a prose level. I think, and, it, and it's really striving to do something with the tools of the fantastic that that I feel like I came as close to to achieving as as, I, as I've ever done. So, while there are certainly bits and pieces of that book that I, that I that I can recognise, this bit is not necessarily well written. This bit is. You know, I, I wouldn't use that adjective here and so on. Um, I think in terms of its kind of overall shape and, and, and so on, um, that, that book is the one that that I feel proudest of. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not indifferent to, to read a reaction. I want people to like the books. Um, but that equally, I do think that just, necess- just because a book is not necessarily as popular as another book doesn't mean you've, failed within your own terms um, and, and I, I, I'll always try and hold up my hands if I think I've fucked something up um, I encounter I, I I mean I will I you know it's not always the easiest thing to do because of course you you know you, you these books matter to you of course they do and, and you do the best you can but I Council is a book that you know I'm well aware not everyone loved but I I feel very 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 committed to very passionate about and not just defensive <laughs> Um, and, and how about, I, I've heard you say that um, a, a majority of readers seem to think that The Scar is uh, sort of the best novel of yours to start with. Um, what do you think that, uh, what do you think it is about that novel that kind of makes it uh, a good place to start? I have no idea. I genuinely don't. I mean, I, I've said when I've said that, I've said that it's, uh, it, it is my impression of the crowdsourced wisdom. Um, and I mean that quite literally, like people say to me, which of yours should I read to start with? And I always say, well, if you don't read much science fiction and you really want to read some, I would read The City and the City. If you're open to fantasy science fiction and you already have a certain, you know, you're not put off by secondary world, my impression is that the majority of people, not an overwhelming majority, but a majority would think The Scar is the best one. I can hypothesize as to why. I think it is more disciplined than Perdido Street Station. The language is not quite as estranging as it is in Iron Council. Um, I know some people didn't like the political aspects of Iron Council, which are still there in The Scar, but perhaps a little more muted. Uh, It has pirates in it. (laughs) Um, You know, I mean, these are hypotheses, but but I guess it possibly it's that. Uh, So when you published Perdido Street Station, uh, steampunk was still relatively, relatively obscure, whereas today it's a massive cultural phenomenon. Uh, what's your take? What's your take on the current state of steampunk? In recent years, I know there's been a, a lot of you know debate about, for example, the political aspects of steampunk. And you know, Charlie Stross wrote his article, the kind of controversial article about steampunk as a kind of um, exoneration of, imper- of of Victorian imperialism, um, a kind of nostalgia for a certain a certain type of you know, um, of, 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 of uh, neglected empire uh, kind of once more with feeling. And then a lot of people kind of responded to that and so on and, and felt he was being unfair. From a position of no great, I mean, I'm not someone who makes a point of keeping up with steampunk, but I was very sympathetic to his, to his uh, approach. I, I, I feel like, you know, I had not at the time, and I, I really don't, you know, want to kind of incur the wrath of 10,000 bloggers and emailers at, at how how many things I'm missing here. But I can simply say I had not at the time seen a particularly large number of steampunk um, artifacts that, uh, that focused with anything like, even mentioned in many cases, but certainly that focused with anything like the centrality that that era actually uh, you know, actually was defined by things like the Raj and the Empire and the, the depredations of Victorian imperialism and so on. 
one of the things that I think, and I, I don't say they weren't there, I just say that they did not necessarily have a high enough profile that I had seen them, although that may just be my ignorance, but I would guess from Charlie's article that it wasn't just my ignorance. I think the fact that that argument is now out there and there are a lot of people writing, if you like, kind of alter-mondialist steampunk is very exciting. Um, you know, I think that kind of argument can really kind of rejuvenate and, 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 and spark kind of, you know, rethinkings of moments and movements and so on. And I, I, I hope that that happens. I hope we get, you know, the steampunk version of, you know, the, the Belgian Congo and the steampunk version of, um, of, of, of the 1857, you know, Indian uprising and all those things, you know, not just played for kind of cool brass goggles, but to kind of, you know, really interrogate some of the, some of the kind of aesthetic assumptions in, in, in that field. Um, personally, I mean, I, I think any moment, any movement, uh, because of the kind of incredibly fast, voracious cycles of cultural production and consumption in which we all um, partake, uh, any, any interesting moment or movement becomes a, a, a kind of cliche and then a self-parody very, very quickly. And I do think it is the case that steampunk has uh, at least a lot of it let me let me let me let me put it that way a lot of it has become so much focused on the kind of you know the cool stuff that um, that kind of endless replication of you know corsets and zeppelins um you know um you know you know strange steampunky eyeglasses and you know you know, typewriter, laptops, that kind of thing, does not interest me very much in itself. It feels like a kind of completely deracinated aesthetic. Um, but if it's part of a kind of interrogation um, and, and, and something new is done with it, uh, then that's great. Um, it's like any of these things. When they become, they become very culturally uh, prevalent, like zombies or vampires or so on, I think my argument is not that one shouldn't do them but just that the bar gets higher and higher and higher so you know i'm not saying i have no interest in anything steampunk i'm just saying that inevitably because there's more of it now i think the bar to kind of adding something interesting to what's going on is higher than it was 10 years ago that's completely self-evident it's exactly the same for any um you know cultural set of tropes and memes that that reach a certain level of saturation uh so tell us about your new tattoo it's um a skull with octopus tentacles or what I tend to shorthand as a sculptus. I mean, when I saw you, uh, I saw you at, um, you know, when Lev Grossman interviewed you in New York and you said that there was a big whole explanation for the tattoo that you didn't have time okay. to time to go into just then. Well, um, it was partly that I didn't have time. It was also partly because I'm very self-conscious about becoming incredibly boring about this um <laughs> mm-hmm. so what I, I mean basically the, the very short version is that it's a, a kind of simultaneous homage to two contradictory i think contradictory traditions of, of, of the fantastic which is the hauntological the ghostly tradition and the weird um the uh the 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 the, the, the what i think of rather than the uncanny as the ab canny um, and I, I, it, it feels to me that those have always pulled in very different directions, one to do with the return of the repressed and one to do with the eruption of the, uh, uh, of the, utterly, un, of the utterly unknown and unthinkable, and these are symbolised to me with, by the skull on the one hand and the octopus on the other, um, uh, and, and, and by the kind of different traditions of the ghost story tradition and the, and the weird fiction tradition. Um, and... To, to steal a term from from philosophy, I can't remember which philosopher it was. It used it, I think, of the the, the tentacled skull as an incompossibility, um, a sort of um, you know kind of coagulation of these two um, n- non um, sublatable traditions. Uh, and I've written, I mean, I, you know, and you know, you can probably now see why I didn't want to go into it with Lev because it's uh, you know, it, it, it's 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 one of those things. Like a lot of tattoos, it's tremendously meaningful to me. It probably, it may very well raise nothing but you know, uh, an eyebrow or uninterest in anyone else. But I wrote an article for a journal called Collapse a couple of years ago. There's an article called. M.R. James and the Quantum Vampire, which is all about this and has a big section in the back all about the Sculptopus and the symbolism of the Sculptopus, which basically explains this. It's available online if you Google it. Um, and that basically explains my, my, my position and my love for this, 
figure um, as, as uh, in as much detail as I'm sure anyone can bear. <laughs> Is that, I mean, had you had that in mind for a long time to get that tattoo or was it some like, was it something uh, that sort of came to you when you went and did it? No, I was, I had been intending for a long time to get an octopus tattoo um, because I'm very committed to octopuses. Um, but I, there was something kind of just slightly holding me back. And then when I was writing this essay and, and I kind of was thinking about these two different traditions and then this kind of coagulation of the two occurred to me because of a film by a, a, a French marine biologist and filmmaker, Jean Pain um, there, there was a, uh, where he has a, he has a film called Le Vampire, which has a, has a scene of, a, of an octopus crawling over a skull and trying to kind of enter it and become part of it. And I was tremendously excited because I realized what had been the missing element, why I'd been holding back uh, was because it was only half the story. And so the moment I thought of that, I knew immediately and I never looked back from that. So 50% of its quiddity I had already thought <laughs> of, 50% came in an epiphanic moment. Uh, okay, so I mean, you've lived in London and you've studied international international relations. Um, what do you think about the uprisings that we've seen recently in London and in the Middle East? Well, it's interesting you make the connection between the two because a lot of people um, don't want to do that. And obviously, I mean, I, I think you're right to do so, although I do think obviously there's, there's, there's very distinct differences. Um, I mean, the uprisings in the Middle East, I don't think one can generalize too much. I think, for example, you know, what's going on in Libya at the moment, um, while I shed absolutely no tears at all for Gaddafi and his regime, is very, very different from what happened in Tahrir Square in Egypt, which was much more, I think, of a kind of, you know, genuinely grassroots driven uh, revolution, which I think, you know, there, there's a, there, I think there were strong elements of that in the early days of the Libyan uprising. But uh, as things changed, there was a certain amount of inevitable kind of um, uh, co-opting and, 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 and steering. And so while I'm very happy to see the back of, of Gaddafi, I'm, you know, I, 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 I don't raise a cheer for NATO's um, involvement. Um, so as a generalization, I think, you know, the, the, the Arab, what has sometimes been called the Arab Spring is one of the most profoundly important moving political events of my lifetime. Um, and I find, partly because I used to live in Cairo, but simply any, uh, in, in Egypt, sorry, but also just because of its world historic importance, I find, you know, the scenes in, 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 in Egypt, you know, almost unbearably moving. And, I, and I'm, I'm kind of on, 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 on concerned tenterhooks because of the, uh, you know, the way the, the revolution has been hijacked by certain elements, you know, within the military and so on. Um, different countries, different situations, um, but there's no question that they've acted as kind of inspirations for each other and so on. Um, and so I'm, you know, count me as a big fan. The question of what went on in London is, you know, I, 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 sus I think you're right that, you know, the, 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 the sort of the kind of shadow of the Middle East was cast over that. And I don't know that it would necessarily have occurred the way it did but obviously it's a very it's a very different situation um the accusations that it's simply a kind of outbreak of mindless criminality are you know sociologically dunderheaded and 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 absurd and i suspect that a lot of the people putting those explanations forward know that um this is a you know the situation in britain is is pretty pretty bad our economy is is bad and the people taking the brunt of that because of very deliberate policies are, are, are the poor and particularly um, the young. Youth services are being destroyed all across the country. Plus, in Britain, we have a culture of, um, of, of, of great antipathy to the young. We have had for a long time. It's, it, it's very, uh, I think in kind of mainstream culture and media and so on, it, it's very ugly the way young people are talked about in the British media. The phrase feral kids is used a lot, which is a phrase that 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 essentially kind of disgraces any mouth out of which it comes but it's very very normal in britain um and then you combine that with you know that that sense of kind of alienation and, and exhaustion and, and and sort of being treated like an animal you combine that with a fair amount of you know a large amount of kind of police harassment and so on in london which was the, as you probably know was the flashpoint 
plenty of people, including the Deputy Prime Minister Clegg, predicted riots um, for some time. So, uh, you know, these things are always surprising when they emerge, but it's not in, in the slightest bit surprising that that, that it was going to happen at some point. And, and the idea that you can punish your way out of these social problems is, is crass, vindictive, and won't work. Okay, so you're a self-described Marxist. I mean, what do you find are some of the biggest misconceptions that people have about you when they hear that you're a Marxist? Um, that I'm a big fan of the Soviet Union, as was. Um, that I only like books by left-wing writers. Um, and I do get frustrated when people say, for example, you know, on the political level, you know, say, well, you know, how can you say this, you know, look at the Soviet Union, it didn't work. And it's like, you know, the tradition of socialism out of which I come has been utterly critical of the Soviet Union for decades, you know, and sees it as no kind of, as no kind of desirable outcome. And similarly, I get very frustrated when, if I ever do any kind of political reading or, or, or criticism of a of a book, uh, of a, of a work of fiction, and there will always be some people who will say, "Oh, well, you know, you're just saying you don't like that because the because the writer is right wing." And I, that I must admit frustrates me because I sort of I want to say, "Look, come and look at my bookshelves. Come and look at you know the writers who I love, whose politics I don't share. Come and look at the books by you know by Gene Wolfe, by H.P. Lovecraft, by Celine. You know, look at the you know it, it, that's just absolutely untrue, and I, I, I do get frustrated at that. Um, but those two are the ones that jump to my mind. Uh, so Tor just re-released your books with a new set of matching covers. Uh, how did that come about, and what did you think of the new covers? Well, it came about because um, I, I think that you know they they wanted to. Th there's been a certain kind of growth of readers who aren't necessarily people who come out of a traditional science fiction or fantasy background, and I'm, it, it, you know, what one can decry this as stupid, but it's simply a fact that. For some readers, you know, they're very put off by certain types of covers that they feel are associated very strongly with a certain type of of of, of, of book or literary tradition. Um, and this is why things like Harry Potter and the um, the Philip Pullman books have adult covers and, and kids covers. You know, um, I think that they wanted in part to kind of have a kind of partly it was a unified look thing. They wanted them all to have the same aesthetic and partly it was as a way of, I think, trying to kind of encourage people that wouldn't necessarily pick up. A more traditional SF or fantasy-looking book to, to to pick it up, um, maybe particularly on the back of the City in the City and uh, Embassy Town, which had readers, you know, who were not necessarily just genre readers. Um, but I do, I, I love the covers. I think they're beautiful. And I, in a way, I, I want to kind of um, correct myself because saying, you know, a traditional genre cover because actually these things are very cyclical and if you look back to for example the Galantz SF books from the late 60s and 70s they were they were not what we would now think of as classic SF looking covers they they used pieces of surrealist art they used extraordinary kind of cutting edge design and uh, very beautiful very abstract aesthetics and so on so you know th there's nothing <laughs> it doesn't represent some kind of generic um treachery to to not have you know uh you know a visible spaceship or uh you know or, or something on the cover it, it it's part of a you know it's it's another way of doing the same thing I, I i have no interest in or desire to disavow my generic roots i'm very much a writer in this tradition and i'm i'm i love this tradition i'm not trying to deny that um but i also think that you know, I, I want to be read as widely as possible. And if, if some people, you know, if this is going to encourage some people to pick the books up that might be a little cherry otherwise, then I'm very happy with that. And the fact that I also think they are genuinely terrific covers is just win-win. Uh, so have you seen the website, Could They Beat Up China Mievel? I have. And so what do you think of that? I think it's awesome. <laughs> I mean, what can I possibly say? I, I I don't know. I mean, I, it, it's very sweet. It's very well written. It's very funny. It's very flattering. Um, it, it made me laugh on more than one occasion. I, I like to think there are some people who I would have taken quicker. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I'm I'm certainly not going to quibble. I was, I was extremely touched that someone went to the effort, and I thought it was fantastic. Okay, and finally, just uh, are there any other new or upcoming projects that you'd like to mention? Um... There's a short story in The Guardian that was on The Guardian online um, called Cove Hive. Um, 
C O V E H I T H E, which um, that I think if someone's looking for, if they, if they haven't seen that then and they like some of the short stories that might appeal. All right, great. Well, China Mievo, thanks so much for joining us on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And that was our interview. So thanks so much to China Mieville for joining us on the show. All right, and so now we're just going to talk a little bit more about China Mieville and the new weird. As you could not help noticing, probably, listening to that interview, China Mieville was really, really freaking smart. Hmm. That was evident to me from the first time I met him. This was actually at uh, the uh, International Conference on the Fantastic and the Arts, uh, which takes place every year in Florida. And so, uh, so I was there. This was probably about 10 years ago now. And uh, I, I ended up at this panel called, uh, Mark, I think it was called Marxism in Science Fiction. And uh, there were probably about, <laughs> I don't know, there were probably about 18 people in the room. And, uh, and you know, one of which was China Mieville. And then there was this, uh, this guy who had written a book called Critical Theory in Science Fiction. And this other guy who sort of edited an academic journal about science fiction, I think. And the three of them started talking about Marxist theory and science fiction, and I can't believe that anyone else in the room had any <laughs> idea what they under had any idea what they were talking about for the entire uh, you know entire session. And you know, at the time, I mean, I had just uh, I had just uh, finished college and I had majored in uh, political science with a, an emphasis on political philosophy. So I mean, I think that's the only uh, time I've ever seen a conversation like that where I just had you know it was just over my head. There were all sorts of uh, scholars they were referring to who I was unfamiliar with and all this terminology I was unfamiliar with. And I was just, I was just kind of like, what the heck just, <laughs> what the heck just happened in there? Uh, I'd never, you know, you know, in China Mievo, I mean, I'm like, I'm looking at him. I'm like, this guy can't be much older than I am. You know, mm -hmm. you know, how did he learn so much? <laughs> when, when, right. when did he learn all this stuff? Yeah. So I, you know, I went and, uh, you know, I was in the dealer's room, I guess later, and there was a copy of Perdita Street Station, which I think it was was had just come out at that point, and so I picked that up. You know, the cover looked cool. I don't know; it sounded kind of interesting, and I was just totally blown away by that novel. And I think especially then, uh, it was just you know you had just never seen anything like it in fantasy. China at the time was very sort of anti-Tolkien. You know, he would he would give these great sort of anti-Tolkien rants during all of his public appearances and. He stopped doing it eventually, unfortunately. He said that, you know, he would show up at conventions and people would be like, China, do the t Tolkien thing. Hmm. And uh, he sort of felt like it was just becoming a shtick. So uh, he kind of, you know, moved on to other uh, topics. But, um, but yeah, I mean, Purdue, Purdue Street Station, I think, was very uh, consciously a sort of anti-Tolkien kind of fantasy, you know, whereas, you know, whereas Tolkien is pastoral, Purdue Street Station is urban and grungy and... You know, Tolkien's politics are fairly conservative, and the politics of Perdido Street Station are fairly radical. And, uh, you know, in sort of Lord of the Rings, the elves and dwarves all kind of live in their own separate cities. And in uh, in Perdido Street Station, all these different monsters all kind of live all mixed up together in this big city. And the, the races are all very, very strange. Uh, you know, there are sort of cactus people and bird people and sort of water... Uh, they're called Vaginoi, sort of water spirits. Uh, and and in, in particular, uh, there's this race called the Kepri, who are, they're sort of, they have sort of human bodies and then the heads of insects. And so the main character, uh, who, who's a human, is is dating uh, one of the Kepri, this Kepri woman. And so uh, uh, one, one thing, one of my, you know, memories of Perdido Street Station that sort of sticks with me is I was talking with Catherine Kramer about it. And she was just noting how, you know, there's sort of uh it's made very clear that, that that this guy is sleeping with this woman who has a bug head, you know, in like chapter three. And it's almost like it's daring you, like the book is daring you to put it down. You know, it's like, are you cool mm -hmm. enough to read this book? Well, here, I'm going to have a sex scene with a bug headed woman, you know, in chapter mm -hmm. three. And uh, if you can't deal with that, you're not cool enough to even read the rest of the rest of my book. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, there are, you know, people call, uh, like criminals in this, the, there's this very sort of sinister authority, uh, the parliament, and uh, it's a very sort of authoritarian, Dickensian kind of uh, society. And uh, criminals are, are remade, they're uh, sort of made into mechanical monsters uh, in ways that somehow fit their crimes. And uh, there are factories, it's a sort of steampunk thing, so there are factories churning out magical 
stuff and dumping magic crap into the rivers and so in kind of the bogs down river from these factories all sorts of weird magical reagents mixed together and cause all sorts of uh you know weird effects and mutations and stuff like that and then there's the, the politics too and, and so like there's a scene where uh there's sort of a peaceful protest and, and suddenly the police show up and just start beating the crap out of everybody and uh and so china Miyavo, i mean you know has been involved in politics and, and said that this was inspired by something that really happened to him and you know that just you know to be part of a peaceful protest and then the police show up and just start beating the shit out of everybody and then it gets reported in the paper that you know that the protester protests turned violent and the police had to break them up and just to have been there and seen what really happened uh you know just really made a big impression on him and just the language too i mean you you probably gathered from the interview that he has just this incredible vocabulary and so the word <laughs> so the uh, actually the the word from uh Pretty industry station that really sticks in my mind is bituminous. Uh, that word gets used a lot, which means sort of coal-like. And uh, essentially the entire city of uh, New Crabazon is uh, is bituminous. It's just all black and sooty and dirty and... Yeah, you know, uh, I've heard of I've heard of people reading China Mieville with a uh, with a dictionary in their lap because of all the, you know, all the different words that he uses that we're not necessarily familiar with. And it occurs to me that uh, that would actually be quite uh, quite a, a useful book to read as an ebook, like on your iPad or something, which has uh, like if you read it in iBooks, like it has like a built in dictionary. So like you can just highlight the word and say, hey, what the hell does that mean? Um, you know, so it's a little easier than actually flipping through a dictionary. Uh, I saw China, um, and, you know, he, he gave a reading and there was a Q&A session and I actually asked him, you know, how did you develop this vocabulary? I mean, did, did you ever... Uh sit down and memorize lists of words or use any kind of vocabulary builder or anything. And he said, no, it's just, just all words he picked up just from, from reading. But I mean, cause, cause I guess, you know, a lot of like Lovecraft and, uh, and his circle, I guess they really did make a conscious effort to, you know, read through dictionaries and find obscure words. Uh, I think one of them, I don't know if it was Lovecraft or Clark Ashton Smith, one of the, one of those guys apparently made it through the, the dictionary three times or something. <laughs> um, you know, and there is there is something to be said for uh, obscure words. I mean, a lot of people will sometimes get angry about that and say, "Oh, why why are you using a word that you know most readers aren't going to know? It's just mm -hmm. uh, perverse or something." Uh, you know, the purpose of language is to communicate. Mm -hmm. But there there is, uh, I think, a uh, something to be said for the effect of unfamiliar words. I mean, I'm reminded, um, you know, there was this article. I think it was in Strange Horizons, sort of bashing uh, Laird Barron for the supposed uh, infelicities of his prose style. And uh, and particularly drawing attention to these strange words that he was using, and uh, I remember Jeff Vandermeer jumped in and said and made this point that you know uh, if you you know like 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 Lovecraft will describe his monstrosities as being squamous and cyclopean or something, and there's just a different effect to that than saying that they're big and slimy. Right. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you just have to have uh, unusual words to convey an unusual situation or unusual, um, you know, creature or something. Uh, I, I think when you use those unfamiliar words, it, it adds a it adds a quality of strangeness to the to the narrative that you wouldn't have if you like you say, if you tried to if you tried to describe them using the simple words like big and slimy or whatever. So, well, so. It, you know, because I, I, I went and saw China Mieville, um you know, they, uh, I, I mentioned in the interview, you know, Lev Grossman interviewed him in New York. And there was this point where Lev Grossman said something kind of jokingly. And, and China Miefel responds kind of joking, jokingly. He says, don't you introduce me, Grossman. <laughs> and, and Lev Grossman was like, I wouldn't even know what that means. <laughs> what does that mean? Slander. Ah. I had to look it up. <laughs> Uh, and, and sort of, you know, I, I mentioned bituminous, I mean, the word from, from China Miaville's second book, The Scar, that sort of stuck with me the most was brachiating. Mm -hmm. There's a part where some, I don't know, there's, there's a reference to some, like some brachiating monkeys or something. Uh, so I looked that one up. That means sort of to pull yourself hand over hand, like on the monkey mm -hmm. bars. Mm -hmm. That's a good word. Yeah. <laughs> Not very many instances where you get mm -hmm. to use that one in everyday right, conversation, right. but. True, true. Uh, and so the, the the scar actually I think is probably my favorite um, of his novels. Uh, um, but but yeah, so it's set in the same world, and there's a woman who was sort of loosely connected to the characters uh, from Purdue Street Station, and she's fled the city uh, on a ship, and her ship ends up getting captured by pirates, 
and taken to this city of floating pirate ships. All It's this huge city that stretches for miles, made entirely out of pirate ships that are all lashed together. Um, and the city is called Armada. And it's ruled by a sort of motley assortment of characters uh, who don't all particularly get along with each other, uh, including a vampire called the Brukalak, and uh, a, a man and woman called the Lovers, who have who have sort of patterns of scars that are mirror images mirror images of each other, um, and this guy called Uther Duel, who has a sort of musical instrument called the Perhapsian, with which he can somehow influence uh, probabilities. And so, uh, after after she's been on this city, I don't know for for a while, weeks or months or something, she uh, gets wind that these that these people uh, that the rulers have sort of this sinister agenda and that they're uh, hoping to lash the city to a massive sea monster called the Avanc, which is sort of uh, going to drag it through these currents that emanate, sort of, you know, water currents that emanate from this place called the Scar, which is sort of this terror in reality, which uh, holds out the promise of, of great power to whoever can reach it. Like, there's, there's, a, there's a part where they, uh, I guess one of, uh, one of the ways China comes up with ideas is just to drop lists of words and just sort of plug them together <laughs> and see what comes out of it. And, and so, so one of the things in the book that came out of that was, was something called the malarial queendom, which is sort of this, uh, empire of, uh, mosquito people, you know, like female mosquitoes are the ones that, that bite you and suck your blood. And so the, the women uh, of this race, you know, are, are sort of blood crazed fiends and, uh, oh, <laughs> it's, oh it's just really creepy. Yeah, so uh, how, how did you react to, uh, you know, because like you say, I mean, the first couple of books he wrote were these were all set in the milieu of Purdue Street Station. But then um, but then everything since then, uh, everything since Iron Council has been uh, sort of drastically different. I haven't like, you know, I haven't liked anything as much as I liked The Scar. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I guess. Uh, but I mean, at the same time, I sort of felt like after Iron Council that I would sort of gotten enough box log for the moment, you know. And I mean, I've been very impressed by, you know, how different all the books are and how imaginative they are. I, I liked The City in the City a heck of a lot. Uh, I think that has one of the most interesting premises I've, I've ever read um, for a book. Um, it's essentially, it's a, it's a police procedural set in this imaginary Eastern European city where uh, it's, it's sort of two cities uh, that inhabit the same physical space. And uh, so some parts are sort of in one city or the other. And then a lot of sections are, is what he calls crosshatched. So they're in both cities at the same time. Um, and, so, and, but the people in the two cities have to maintain this fiction that they live in separate cities. And so you have to pretend that you can't see anyone from the other city, even though they're, you know, walking around shoulder to shoulder with you. And if you ever, uh, acknowledge the people from the other city, this sort of shadowy organization called breach shows up. And uh, you know, arrest you or whatever, and and so actually, you know, the the, the plot it's this murder mystery where the, where the detective finds this body, you know, that's in the wrong city and nobody knows how it got there, and so he has to actually, uh, you know, go through sort of customs to go to the other city, even though he's lived in it, <laughs> you know, he's lived shoulder to shoulder with it his entire life, and then he can, then he has to pretend that he can't see, you know, his own city. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and everything is suddenly new because now he can actually, even though he's walked these streets his whole life, now he can sort of pay attention to the people and places in the other city. Embassy Town, I actually what I liked quite a lot too, uh, that we talked about in the interview. This is his first science fiction novel. Um, and the premise of this one is sort of that uh, humanity has established contact with this alien race called the Arieki. And the, the, the Arieki have two mouths and sort of speak a different string of syllables out of each mouth that combine to, to form their language. And they can only understand language that works the same way. So, you know, humans try to talk to them and they don't even realize that we're trying to talk to them because they only uh, recognize language when it's sort of one mind speaking with two voices. Uh, and humans eventually are able to, to communicate with them sort of by creating uh, pairs of clones called ambassadors who each uh, speak, you know, they speak at the same time and sort of mimic the speech of the Arieki, but they have to be totally synced in terms of their um, sort of thought processes, or else the Arieki don't realize, don't recognize 
their words as speech. Uh, and the Ariaki also, they have, as, as China was saying in the, in, in the interview, they have no sense of, uh, of, of metaphor. And so everything, you know, they can't lie and they can't use figurative expressions, uh, except under very spe specialized circumstances. Uh, so it's just a really, really fascinating, uh, fascinating world, uh, in that book too. Uh, I guess, you know, and he also, he wrote this, uh, and one of my favorite things that he's written is actually, uh, a novella, um, although it was sort of published, I think, as a, as a book, I read it in a, uh, anthology, uh, but it's called The Tain. Mm. And, uh, in that one, uh, it, uh, posits that when you look into a mirror, you're actually looking into, looking into another world. And the people in the other world are sort of free to go about their lives unless someone in uh, someone in our world is looking in a mirror at them, and then they're forced to uh, take on our forms and mimic our our movements. And uh, and this didn't used to be a problem when mirrors were fairly rare, but as technology progresses and more and we create more and more mirrored surfaces, their world is bec they're becoming more and more enslaved to to just mimic us. And so they finally revolt and shatter their way through all the mirrors and uh, try to take over our world. I guess I just wanted to talk about, you know, some of the interesting things uh, I've sort of heard China say uh, on panels and stuff. Uh, he has this thing he says uh, that I think is really funny where he's talking about, you know, people often ask him, you know, why, why do you write fantasy? And, you know, will you ever just write something that's straight realism someday? And he says, oh, I don't know, it could happen, but probably not that just some people are just, just think in fantastical terms and, and some people don't. And, uh, and his example of this is that, uh, when he was living with a, a former girlfriend, she once said to him, uh, you know, the refrigerator men are coming tomorrow. <laughs> and he says, you know, there's sort of, most people would, would just hear that and just imagine some guys coming to repair the refrigerator, you know, <laughs> which is of course how she meant it. But a certain, you know, segment of the population will just hear that and just imagine sort of half man, half refrigerator machine men, you know, coming mm -hmm. and, uh, and that that's just who he is and that's how he sees the world. And if, if that's the kind of person you are, you know, you're just naturally drawn to, to fantasy. And then another thing he talks about a lot is just sort of the geek tendency to just sort of systematize everything and, uh, qu try, you know, try to quantify everything, even, even things that really shouldn't be quantified. And, and so the example he gives of that is just that, uh, you know, if you read HP Lovecraft, you know, a, a, a central character in Lovecraft's work is this sort of evil God from outer space called Cthulhu. The whole idea in Lovecraft is that Cthulhu is just sort of beyond human comprehension. He's just so strange that, and so strange and otherworldly and inhuman that even to just try to understand him will drive you, a human being insane. So then, you know, people create a role-playing game based on that called Call of Cthulhu. And then you just look up Cthulhu, <laughs> you know, in the book and it says like Cthulhu strength 100. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but I mean, yeah, I mean, like when China Medieval first came on the scene, it just seems like everyone was talking about this thing called the new weird, which was, you know, yeah, this, this movement, uh, exemplified by, by China Medieval and, um, supposedly, uh, you know, having more of a focus on, you know, cities and particularly dirty cities and the grotesque and being more, uh, politically aware and politically, uh, radical and stuff like that. Sort of one of my dominant memories of, of the new weird was that I was talking to an author and he was saying, you know, like, what, like, what is new weird? Like, is it just another way of saying China Mieville? Huh. And if it is, why not just say China Mieville? Like, who does it, because, because everyone could sort of agree that, that this new weird label applied to China Mieville. And there didn't seem to be a great deal of, uh, overlap on, overlap of agreement on who else, uh, it might apply to. If you look at, well, if you look it up on Wikipedia, they mentioned Jeff Vandermeer as another, uh, person that the label gets applied to. Although, I mean, and a lot of the authors who sort of the label was applied to, I mean, had been doing sort of their own thing for a long time. And so it, it gets very hard to say, you know, who, who was, might've been part of a movement of, of any kind. Uh, it actually seemed like everybody, including Jeff Vandermeer, who this was applied to initially was resisting the term, uh, at least for a while. And then at some point Vandermeer um, accepted it because he edited uh, an anthology called the new weird, which is, sort of like the uh the textbook for understanding what the new weird is yeah although i i just i looked that up on on wikipedia and they have a quote from gardner dozois and he says that this anthology ultimately left me just as confused as to what exactly mm -hmm. the new weird consisted of when i went out of it as i had been when i went in 
That kind of seems appropriate, though, doesn't it? Something <laughs> like that. It's like you can't understand it. If you try, you'll go mad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's sort of the Cthulhu of, of literary <laughs> genres. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I haven't read this anthology. I mean, I I sort of brought up the table of contents, and it looks like it's a really good anthology. Although, yeah, it, it's it's not at all clear what standards would make something eligible for inclusion or not. I mean, they have uh, uh, a story called the hill in the hills, the cities by Clive Barker, uh, which is just an amazing story. Um, it's, it's sort of, uh, I think set in Eastern Europe and it's about these villagers who kind of every 10 years or something, they will all lash themselves together so that they form giants, you know, made up entirely of human bodies. And then they kind of walk around the countryside and uh and this is a, a year in which this ritual goes horribly horribly wrong um and it's just an amazingly vivid uh <laughs> grotesque sort of story but it's it's not clear to me i guess some of these stories must be sort of like precursors to new weird or mm-hmm. or something but it's i don't know it's not clear to me how that one especially fits uh the same thing with uh, the neglected garden by kathy coge is an amazingly cool story uh it's sort of a contemporary horror story about a woman who uh uh, her marriage is falling apart and she becomes obsessed with maintaining her garden and becomes more and more a part of, of the garden in a really creepy, grotesque way. But how is it new weird? I don't know. I'm not really sure. I haven't read Felix Gilman, but I've heard him read some s- sections of some of his stories. And that does seem fairly new weirdish to me from, from what I've read. So I, I, I can go with that one. Um, certainly people um, at the time were talking about KJ Bishop and Steph Swainston, who were included in, in this anthology as sort of exemplars of the new weird did you actually see, did you see that steph swainston just uh, announced that she's giving up writing to yeah, I saw that. become a yeah. high school chemistry teacher <laughs> yeah that seems like an odd choice but okay um but yeah i guess i guess she just sort of felt like uh publishing was just too frustrating that publishers want you to write a book every year and mm-hmm. i guess there's a lot of you get a lot of harassment from entitled readers and <laughs> what i've never heard of that well, I actually, this has not been a big problem for me, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's kind of funny actually to hear of of someone uh, doing this or making this decision is because uh, most of the time you hear you hear writers say that you know they have no choice but to write and you know like they they, they couldn't actually get, uh, make that choice to give up writing. So it's interesting to see that someone as successful as uh, as she's been um, to just to, to walk away from it. But I mean, uh, I, I but- suspect she might be walking away from publishing. Mm. more than writing you know mm-hmm. I, I suspect she'll probably still have creative projects i think she's just yeah sort of yeah had it at least for the moment with the uh you know the publishing industry which is you know perfectly understandable well see people who get fed up with that they should just write short stories because you know i mean it's like i mean i guess there's still some frustration there but uh but at least with a short story you know you can't you know you don't get locked into that you know oh i have to turn out a novel a year thing um, you know, you're not really indebted to anyone. I mean, you know, you could get uh, recruited to participate in an anthology or something. But I mean, other than that, I mean, you know, basically writing short stories is all on spec. So um, did you I mean, you I mean, you've been editing. I mean, this whole period that the new weird sort of came out and mm-hmm. and it seems like it's sort of uh, rece- I don't hear too many people you throwing the term around these days. Um, but I mean, I don't know. Did, did you sort of see that in your submissions? Uh Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I can't say that I can think of any examples off the top of my head, but I mean, um, you know, of unpublished stories, uh, certainly there were, there were a number, there were a number of stories back when I was at, uh, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, you know, when, uh, th- that would have been when, when, when China's novels first came out, you know, there were certainly a, a number of stories that were submitted that were obviously influenced by China and, and were trying to emulate his style or, or trying to emulate, um, you know, emulate his new weird sort of feel or vibe, I can't say that it was uh, overwhelming. Uh, like uh, there's there's other writers and styles that I think have been more sort of prevalent. Like like I think Kelly Link, mm. uh, probably the the type of story that she writes, uh, she's she's been very influential on 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 the sort of the current up and coming generation of writers and and influencing the way they write and tell stories. Um, I mean that sort of influence has been much more prevalent than I, I think than than something like China or the New Weird. But uh, but yeah, I mean certainly there there had been some and and uh, I, I don't know that I don't know if there if I could pinpoint any writers who came up during that period who then you know sort of ended up writing stuff like him. I mean I guess some of the writers we mentioned already uh, who are in this anthology uh, and like Felix Gilman and, and people like that. But 
Yeah, I don't know. I think I think as a genre or as a movement goes, uh, the new weird seems to have been fairly constrained. You know, whereas like if you do a book like this, like the new weird anthology, like, I think it, it's very easy for for that to be like volume one, and then there to be a whole bunch of other stuff left over that you know that comes after it or whatever, and then you would have some temptation to do another one. Like you know, the Vandermeers also did a steampunk anthology, and then like a year or two later, they did the a second steampunk anthology because there's so much of it right now. Um, like I didn't see that happening with the new weird. Um, and I don't know that there is a whole lot of it that's been published since this anthology came out that, you know, to, to, to warrant like a second volume or whatnot. And I mean, it could be that it's out there. It could be that it's out there and that I'm seeing it and, and that I just don't, I don't understand the term well enough. I would not presume to edit such an anthology myself because I, I, I like you, I don't, I don't know that I really understand the, the boundaries of what makes something new weird and, and does not. I mean, do you think that new weird had something to do with steampunk becoming so popular? Because, I mean, it seems like when Perdita Street Station came out, that steampunk was sort of a novelty still. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like today, I mean, that I, I, I feel like there are almost as many, if not more, steampunky kind of fantasy books coming out as sort of medieval fantasy kind of books coming out. Oh, yeah, there's definitely a ton of, ton of steampunk type stuff coming out these days. Um, and, and you might be right, it might be rivaling the sort of uh, traditional medieval style epic fantasy stuff. But, yeah, I don't know, that's hard to say. I mean, it's possible, certainly. I mean, if... Uh, if China's, if Perdido Street Station is like the sort of keystone for, uh, for where all the steampunk came from, um, then certainly I could see that as being uh, related to the new weird in a way. But I, I don't see a lot of crossover otherwise, uh, like in the new weird and steampunk. Like I don't, I don't see a lot of steampunk that deals with, you know, that kind of weird story element that that the new weird plays with, but. But yeah, I mean, it seems like maybe they, they, they may have actually sprung from the same source. So that's kind of interesting. All right, then I guess uh, just the last thing I was going to mention. Actually, you know, speaking of the Scar, I mean, when I read that, I really, really wanted to see someone do a uh, you know, computer game version of that, you know, hmm. that would allow you to, uh, you know, to walk around on that, you know, floating city made out of pirate ships. And uh, I actually just saw, I just looked on Wikipedia that somebody actually did some sort of, uh, uh, well, I'll just read this. It says, Mieville's novel, The Scar is the inspiration for the Armada breakaway floating sim in the virtual world of Second Life. The region is described as having evolved after a storm causes it, causes it to break away from Armada, the pirate city, in Mieville's story. So I guess, uh, I haven't, I don't actually, I haven't played Second Life, but I guess if, uh, if people have, maybe go check that out. I mean, that sounds pretty cool. Um, are there any limits on what people in Second Life can make in terms of create, you know, replicating stuff from copyrighted materials? I would think that it actually should be, um, you know, should they should be uh, playing with the same rules as 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 anyone else on, you know, writing fanfic and whatnot. I mean, it, it seems like it's a derivative work. I mean, I think it's just a matter of uh, if the uh, if the owner of the of the work actually cares if they're doing it or not. I don't know. It's a hard. To, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, because uh, I was actually just talking about the uh, sort of similar situation with uh, someone uh, at Worldcon, and I, I was talking about how there's this band, Blind Guardian, who um, who you know they a bunch of their songs are sort of about Tolkien about Middle Earth and whatnot and then they have a their recent album is about the Wheel of Time and you know the the lyrics include lines like you know I am the Dragon Reborn and and they say the Wheel of Time here and then you know there and now and then so I mean obviously it's 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 like inspired by the song but like I, I kind of wondered well are, are they actually allowed to just do that without getting permission from the author because I mean it's like you know their entire song is based on the work of somebody else. And, you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, as, a, as an author, uh, maybe you've run into this, but like, you know, if you, if you want to quote a lyric in a, in a story, like you have to pay like some outrageous licensing fee, usually, you know, like, uh, like if you want to quote the Beatles or something, probably forget about it. You like, you never be able to afford it. So it's just kind of interesting that, that, that might, that would be, a, that would be allowed for music to do that based on literature, but literature can't just quote a, a line of a song uh, to use in an epigraph or whatever. But yeah, so like, I mean, with that in it, like if, if, if the music thing is actually fine and they don't have to get permission, then yeah, maybe, maybe the same is true of Second Life. I don't know. Um, it seems to me like they should have to get permission, but um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a copyright lawyer, so I don't know. Um, and then just the other thing I wanted to mention was, uh, it also says, uh, in 2006, it was announced that Mieville's short story Details uh, was turned into a script by David Kay and subsequently picked up by Paramount Vantage. Uh, the script was said to expand upon the original story's exploration of pareidolia and rework the plot to feature a father and daughter. As of September 2008, no further information has surfaced regarding the project. 
Yeah, so I don't know. It sounds like maybe nothing is actually going to happen with that, but you never know. That's a pretty cool story. That's actually the story that's uh, going to be uh, in the same anthology, this New Cthulhu uh, anthology that my story is in. It's, uh, it originally appeared in that um, Children of Cthulhu anthology. Um, but it's essentially, it's, uh, it's sort of a, uh, an updating of um, Lovecraft's story, The Music of Eric Zahn. That's a similar sort of setup where somebody's kind of locked in their apartment trying to fend off uh, otherworldly incursions. Uh, in, in this case, in the case of this story details, you know, I guess pareidolia, you know, is, uh, you know, so pareidolia is where you sort of see patterns where, where none actually exist. And so in this story, this, this woman has uh, realized that she can see that sort of, you know, the, the confluence of random details in the environment sort of form into shapes that allow you to see into other dimensions, kind of. And, uh, and that once you've seen into the, these other dimensions, the, the monsters that work in those dimensions, you know, they don't like being looked at and they start coming after you. And so she's sort of locked herself in her apartment and all sort of, uh, sort of plastered it over <laughs> so that there are no, you know, so it's just this sort of blank white surface everywhere she looks and there are no cracks or dots that can form themselves into shapes that will, you know, uh, permit her to, to look into these other worlds, uh. Is there anything of China's that you that you think could be filmed, uh, you know, into a like a feature film? Probably Embassy Town. You could do. I mean, you know, I would love to see a movie of the Scar, but that would just, you know, blow the budget out of any. I, I can't even imagine. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, there's so many storylines and things that. But even if you were to pare that down, just the the visual stuff. Uh, I don't know. That would be an amazing uh, undertaking. I guess the city in the city would be kind of cool. You, you would just see all these people walking past each other, affecting not to notice each other. That could be very, uh, very visually interesting. All right, so I think we're going to just wrap things up there. If you'd like to help us out, of course, you can uh, go to our website at geeksguideshow.com and click on any of the ads for audible.com, our sponsor. And, uh, you know, if you sign up for a free trial subscription, you'll get a free audiobook. And uh, some books you might want to check out, of course, are books by China Mieville. Four of his books are available on audio right now. Um, Purdue Street Station, Kraken, The City in the City, and his newest book, Embassy Town. So uh, check those out. Uh, and if you'd like to help us another way, you could also uh, leave comments on io9. If you go to our website at geeksguideshow.com, you can find uh, the find the entry for this episode. Just click on that. That'll take you right to io9. Um, and then you know, if you, you leave a comment, that way, uh, that way io9 knows that you love us. Um, and also, if you go to iTunes, you can uh, look for Geek's Guide to the Galaxy there and uh, just like you leave a review or rating on there. And, uh, you know, only only five star ratings, please. You know, like, if, you, if you don't like us, you know, don't bother to rate. But, you know, if you want to support the show, you can help help out by uh, leaving a review or rating. Uh, that way other people will know that uh, it's a good show worth checking out. All right. So thanks again for listening and uh, we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of io9. For this episode's show notes, to subscribe to this podcast, or for more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your hosts, visit johnjosephadams.com or davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by Slipgate 9 Entertainment. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.